This is Al Jazeera. Hello there, I'm Julie McDonald. This is the Al Jazeera News Hour live from London coming up. High level talks in Ukraine with a plea to prevent the war from creating a nuclear catastrophe. And we must tell it as it is any potential damage to Zaporizhia is suicide. Welcome to the News Hour. Ukraine's president has held high stakes talks with the UN Secretary General and Turkish president in Lviv in a bid to bring six months of conflict to an end. Recep Tayyip Erdogan has maintained relations with both Ukraine and Russia during the war and positioned himself as a go between in efforts to stop the fighting. The three leaders also discussed Ukrainian grain exports and the safety of Europe's largest nuclear power plant in Zaporizhia. It's been shelled multiple times and there are fears of a possible nuclear disaster. It is unacceptable that Russia is intentionally bringing us on the verge of radiation catastrophe on a global scale. We've agreed with Mr. Secretary General with parameters for the possible visit of an IAEA mission to Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in the legal way that involves their movement through territory which is free of the occupying forces. Theresa Bull has more now from Lviv. A very high-level meeting happening here in Lviv uh, with the Turkish president present here, Volodymyr Zelensky, Ukraine's president, and of course the presence of the United Nations Secretary General. In this meeting, all of that's happening in Ukraine now, now, the war in Ukraine, but also its impacts around the world was discussed. Uh, it was talk about the landmark deal that was uh, happened uh, a month ago, where it was agreed with the help of Turkey and the United Nations to start exporting grain from Ukraine to the rest of the world. It was also discussed the situation at the nuclear power plant of Saporizhia, but also the possibility of peace. Uh, Turkish president said that he's ready to, to host and to facilitate peace talk. He said that uh, all of this problem should be resolved in a negotiating table, that it's the fastest and the easiest uh, way. Volodymyr Zelensky, Ukraine's president, says that Ukraine is ready for peace, but that it's not ready to renounce to any of its territories, and it wants the territories that were occupied by Russia, uh, he wants uh, to get them back. On the other hand, uh, the United Nations Secretary General was very clear that he denounced once again what he said was Russia's violations of Ukraine's uh, territorial integrity. He said that he believed in peace, but that peace has to be achieved through international law, respecting the United Nations charter. So many, many things were discussed in this, including, for example, a fact-finding mission after the killing of at least 40 prisoners of war in the town of Olenivka. Apparently, Ukraine says that they were killed by Russia in an explosion. And right now, the United Nations Secretary General says that a fact-finding mission is necessary to find out who was behind their death. Russia's defense ministry has claimed Ukraine is planning what it describes as a provocation at the Zaporizhia nuclear plant on Friday. The Russians control the facility and the area around it, but it's still run by Ukrainian engineers. The Kyiv regime is preparing a resonant provocation at Zaporizhia nuclear power plant during the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres's visit to Ukraine. And the result, the Russian Federation will be blamed for creating a technological disaster at the power plant. Russia has moved three fighter jets carrying hypersonic missiles to Kaliningrad in a separate part of Russia located between NATO members Poland and Lithuania. Moscow says it's a defensive move and the aircraft will be on round-the-clock combat alert. The hypersonic missiles can accelerate to 10 times the speed of sound and hit targets at a range of more than 2,000 kilometers. They're capable of carrying both conventional and nuclear warheads. Well, President Zelensky honoured some of Ukraine's military during his visit to Lviv. The Ukrainian president met wounded soldiers in a hospital and handed out medals to thank them for their service. He also made a special trip to a cemetery in Lviv to honour fallen soldiers. Well, Michael Bokserku is a global affairs analyst and senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. He joins us by Skype from Lviv. Michael, great to have you on the programme. The stakes for these talks, I suppose, couldn't be higher given that we're now six months into this conflict. Can we be hopeful at least that these talks are a start of pretend, that they'll yield some sort of progress? Uh, good to be with you. Well, of course, um, 
talks are better than no talks. And indeed, this was the first time that President Zelensky has met with a foreign leader outside of Kiev since the war began. But whether um, people in Ukraine are sleeping easier tonight because of these talks, I'm not so sure. Just before I came on air, the air raid sirens here started to blare again just uh, three hours after the talks ended. So it could mean uh, missiles are headed this way. We don't know. But uh, that's the kind of insecurity that people feel here, even though those types of talks have happened. If you ask me whether there was a big takeaway to get it today, I don't think so. However, of course, um, all sides uh, reiterated their commitment to that grain corridor, which is vital not only for Ukraine, but for the rest of the world. And um, I think the fact that uh, President Erdogan spoke so strongly about the dire threat posed by the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, the way the Russians are handling that, uh, does say something. Finally, um, to have an interlocutor like Mr. Erdogan, who's relatively trusted by the Russian side and trusted here by the Ukrainian side is a very good thing to have because, uh, again, if there were no talks, no communication going on, we'd be in a worse situation, I think. Do you think, Michael, that the success that we've seen from um, the Ukrainian grain efforts being moved through Black Sea ports. I mean, I think a lot of people in the international community were surprised at the way that that was handled and the fact that it is a success. So does that mean that that kind of approach can be built upon? Yeah, in um, the diplomatic business, we call these confidence-building measures. So the fact that that apparatus is working, that Joint Coordination Center in Istanbul seems to be working. But let's face it, I mean, we've only seen a few ships go so far. It's going to take an estimated 500 or so mm -hmm. over the next three or four months to clear the backlog. The other thing that um, didn't really seem to come out today, although it would have been good, is a firm agreement on the exchange of uh, prisoners of war. As I was walking towards the talks today, there were a few dozen uh, protesters and family members of those prisoners of war on, you know, being held by their Russian-backed thugs in Donetsk. And um, let me tell you, if you look into their eyes and into their faces, it's just heartbreaking because they don't even know whether their loved ones are alive. So it's too bad that there was no firm agreement on that today. And Michael, I suppose one of the other very urgent issues is the situation at Zaporizhia. And it's such an open question I'm asking you here, but how can progress be made on this particular issue? Because there seems to be just a, a continual stalemate. Yeah, well, you know, I think um, this is a, a classic example of Mr. Putin playing by the Russian playbook that and they don't give something without something in return. So what I mean by that is in return for allowing those uh, uh, UN inspectors in or in return for a demilitarized zone around the power plant, he would be expecting something in return. And some analysts say that could mean, for example, stemming some of the flow of those high-tech weapons coming from the West, because Russia is not doing well um, in its um, so in its war in Ukraine. And also the fact that Russia, the, in Crimea, they've received at least three attacks from what's believed to be Ukrainian special forces or Ukrainian sympathizers, um, puts them in a very bad spot. So they know that with this plant, the dire situation there, they know that with still fresh memories of Chernobyl, that they are in a very good bargaining position. But I don't think the West or Ukraine can buckle on this one. This is, this is a question about the future of humanity at the end of the day, because if something could go wrong in that plant, it could affect millions and millions of people around the globe. Michael Bosserku there joining me from Lviv. Michael, as always, thank you. My pleasure.